Welcome everybody to our Digital Services Forum bi-weekly call. Today we're gonna fortunate enough to have a CIO with us to give us some CIO perspectives and we'll do some introductions in a while on how we use ServiceNow for a digital transformation platform. What we're gonna do is, I always go through in the beginning with the group, if today's your first time, we, use, we like to use the chat a lot. So if you could post your name in the chat and where you're from, that'd be great. Just so that others can welcome you to the group. And um, there's a link at the bottom here that I'm going to post in the chat. I put it in the chat every week. It's a link to all of the resources we use. We are a forum, so we have a couple things available to us. The first thing is this Zoom registration that you all registered for today. We also have the forum homepage, uh, which will be the forum homepage is our community in ServiceNow communities. We have a YouTube playlist where we put all these meetings and then some other uh, video assets that we keep as a part of the forum. And then we have a shared instance and you can request that shared instance access from me. Sometimes we'll do demos on that shared instance. So this way, if the person that's doing the demo doesn't wanna be passing it out to everybody individually, you can just say, look, I put that, that configuration or that code or whatever on the shared instance. So that those are the four resources that we use for the group. And like I said, I'll post this link so that everybody has access to those four resources. And those four main links will get you to anything that the group actually shares with people. That brings us to our vision, mission, and, we're, and, and what we're actually doing. We initially started this group to focus on CMDB, digital service delivery, and, and doing a lot of that work on the business side of the CMDB to configure services and things like that. And we realized that everybody was trying to do that, the purpose that everybody, the why behind all that was for digital transformation. So we switched about two years ago to being a thought leader in digital transformation <laughs> as part of um, doing this work that we're doing. So our mission is to enable all our members to drive their own digital transformations using the platform. We share as much work as we can so that you're not redoing things, whether it's just a discussion like we're having today and we record that, could be papers, it could be things we share on that shared instance, and then also videos, any videos that we have. So we have some papers, you'll see some papers if you go on our community, you'll see some links to videos, you'll see decks that we shared. So this way you can take them and use them in your own organization. This is hosted by the EA team, so a lot of the topics you'll see are enterprise architecture related. And then we do our main way of getting information out is this call you're on today, these bi-weekly calls. And we have them, we've been having them every other week since 2018, right? And our agenda today is pretty simple. We're gonna have a round table with uh, Riz and Martin are gonna come on and uh, talk about their perspectives. And that's gonna be most of the agenda today. And I think at the end, we'll open it up for a little Q and A. So real, real simple, straightforward agenda. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Martin so we don't spend any more time in the kind of the um, housekeeping part. So Martin, I think you could take screen share away, right? Yep, let me make sure I can, make sure everybody can see my screen. Yes, sir, it looks good. All right, yeah, so just uh, today's not about me, it's mm -hmm. about Riz, but just for those that I haven't gotten to meet, I'm a peer of John's, my name's Martin Chaparria, based out of Houston, but I support all of the, basically Texas to Florida to Boston. So I've gotten to work with many of you um, as clients and customers. Before coming over four and a half years ago, I was um, I was a ServiceNow customer myself for about eight years. So been around the platform since about 2010. Uh, and I'm excited because today we've got um, Rizwan Jan with us, who um, has, has um, numerous, numerous experiences in and around the platform. So Riz, I'm not going to um, have you read all of this, but uh, if you don't mind taking some time, introduce yourself to the group a little bit about your background, then we'll jump into more of just a fireside kind of Q&A. Sure, thanks Martin and John, thanks for having me. Uh, so yeah, been been in IT in the cyber world for over 20 years. Uh, so I'm, I, I joined CNA here about, about nine and a half months ago uh, as their new CIO. So I lead obviously their IT operations, their cyber. And then uh, what's new to me in this role is uh, I'm running their industrial base 
security too. So we work in a classified environment, uh, work with the Navy. So our mission is the safety and security of the U.S. Uh, nation and homeland. And prior to CNA, I was at HJF, Henry M. Jackson Foundation, and uh, their mission was to do uh, military medicine for, for obviously uh, the military. They were congressionally authorized by Ronald Reagan and was their CIO over there, as well as their CISO, and uh, did a lot of work prior to that at Booz Allen, uh, doing a lot of SOC and incident response in the cyber world, PCI, and then, uh, you know, prior to that, and, and Aetna, HP, uh, AIG, so all the big boys that are in the industry, so, and, and here I am now, uh, just about to share our digital transformation service now story. Awesome. Yeah, and it's great to have you and thank you for joining us. Uh, many of those names you just threw out are service now shops as well. So, um, okay, let's just jump in. Um, and uh, we, we will have some time at the end just for the audience to, for you to just kind of pepper um, Riz and, and, and make him super uncomfortable with any of your questions as well. But before that, um, so let, let's just start at the beginning. You know, you mentioned you're with uh, HJF. What what motivated um, HJF to undertake a digital transformation effort, and what were the specific business challenges that that you were trying to trying to address? Uh, so uh, I'll backtrack a little bit. So when I joined HJF in 2016 as their CISO, I came in. Then you know uh, they they are again congressionally authorized. They're doing a lot of PHI PII work, and they did not have a uh, cyber department. Uh, so I came in there as a CISO, built out their entire cyber department um, in about 10 months. And it was just me, but I, I recruited, built out, uh, you know, SOC, incident response, third-party risk governance, you name it, application security. So about a year in, um, we got a new CEO in place, uh, a 35-year-old, 35 years in, in the the Army two-star general, and he was also the the, the chief medical officer for the Joint Chiefs of Staff at the Pentagon. And this is what's the motivation, right? It stops from, it really starts from the top. He came in and wiped out the entire executive staff. The only person he kept was me. And the reason why is uh, a culture that's pretty resistant to change. Uh, and he saw my track record. I was able to build out a whole department and then he elevated me CIO. And he's like, Riz, basically you're interim and you gotta, you gotta earn it. And my, my one question is, do you want me to keep the ship steady or, or do you want me to be audacious? And he's like, you own it like it's yours. So uh, I, I did an evaluation within our IT department, right? I mean, we had tickets open. You always look internally before I could even provide support externally, right? We had tickets open for 250 plus days. You know, the only reason these tickets were even being closed at the service desk level was, you know, employees, customers, and partners are leaving or, or people were frigging dying, right? It, it, it was like that type of scenario. No standards, no processes in place. So I, I brought in ServiceNow to start with the ITSM, which then boiled over to, of course, CMDB, ITOM, and really standard was able to standardize uh, my IT department. From there, what happened was, and, and my service now representatives warned me about this, and I kind of did not believe it at the time. Like, once you get your house in order, you're going to start seeing these business stakeholders coming to you because they want to fix some of their uh, business requirements as well. And I was, again, very skeptical of that. And But sure enough, uh, you guys were right, and, and that happened. Um, so we started building out a whole policy oh, initiative for our compliance people uh as well so that 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 was a that was a big win externally and then from there you know our business development people wanted to build out a crm we were able to do that uh we were able to build out their, our internet and all that stuff so it started to rapidly you know it was like a domino effect people started talking and then the shadow it started getting squeezed out as well because then we were able to build out some street cred and uh get a lot of work done and, and, and we were starting to, to really become partners with the business versus just being a, uh, a task taker. Yeah, I love that. I love the, the, using the term partners of the business. Um, that had to be pretty uh, nerve wracking, right? Last man standing as you wipe out executive staffs. Um, you you have to lead this effort with, with your neck on the line. Um, how, how did ServiceNow factor into that digital transformation strategy? And then talk a little bit about some of the challenges you had uh, implementing it initially. 
Yeah, the, the strategy service now is the core of our strategy, right? I, I'm all about to minimize our technology stack as much as possible, right? Easier to maintain, easier on, on my staff too, so they can have a good work-life balance. The challenge is, I would say, not just at HGF, even my current organization, and, and I'm sure a lot of people could, um, you know, agree with me here, which was having the business sit down with you to really map out their business requirements Generally, what happens, right, is like, hey, we have this business problem, IT fix it for us. And, and then what, what happens? IT tries to fix a problem without the business engagement, and then we roll out a crappy product. So that was a challenge to have people actually sit there. You know, people are like, hey, I'm busy. I can't do this or I can't do that. But my, my response to that, hey, you were not that busy when you're bringing up these problems with me, right? So do you want to fix the problem or do you not? Because this is not going to just be me holding the bag. And, um, and you know, what I try to tell my team here and, and my previous organizations, like we, we're not a doormat, right? We, we want to partner with you. And um, those days of IT being a task taker or just a, uh, a waiter or waitress, those days are over. We, we're uh, here, right? We're, we're a business partner and we want to help. So let's, the analogy I always use is if you're painting a room, right? You, you're going to tape, do drop cloth, you're going to prep it. That prep work takes a lot of time. Those are your business requirements. Once we get those business requirements in place, right? The painting is going to be really, really fast. The product, building the product is going to be fast. So those are some of the challenges, but you have to go around one by one, start building those relationships, start build those trusts, and then they'll start sitting with you and they'll proactively start, you know, providing information. And, and not only that, you, this is your time to educate them too, is like, this is your time to change how you do work, right? If you're taking 14 steps to complete one task, then maybe you want to trim that down to two or three steps. So try to be innovative and think about, uh, work efficiency versus, hey, this is how we used to do it. So we're going to kind of lift and shift this into service now. And so I really wanted them to start thinking outside the box and become uh, innovators within their own business. That's great. I, I love that. And I love the terms um, uh, that, that you're using here. I, I want to do a little impromptu survey. So we're going to use the chat here. How many of you feel like you are actually um, aligned with the business yeah, as part of your IT strategy and IT organization. Pop in a yes, no, maybe a comment, something in the chat. We'll keep that conversation going. One of the terms I've always not really been a fan of is aligning IT with the business because IT is part of the business. Like whatever your, your corporate strategy is, whatever those goals and targets are, it it, it it's going to require, um, you know, IT and IT's involvement, a digital involvement, shouldn't be separate. So I love hearing that about it. And also real quick, um, who was it that posted that comment about the uh, the Phoenix project? Yeah, I was thinking the exact same thing. That That's fantastic. It's lived out in real life. Um, okay, so we're, we've talked about a little bit about the technology and how ServiceNow was an enabler. We'll get a little more into that. But I want to start off by saying, hey, one of the things I hear all the time, me as a customer, other customers I talk to, we don't really sure that we have the right operating model, right? The right skills, the right roles, the right governance. How, how did you address this? <laughs> it's a loaded question. It's always back to your traditional uh, IT and cyber components, right? People, process, and technology. Um, I, I did not try to roll out technology because that's where you're going to fail, right? So I started focusing on people, which was either people are transitioning out through natural attrition or you know, sometimes they don't fit, unfortunately, within where we're trying to head. So focus on the people, start pumping in training and, and cut the handcuffs off of them, too, so they could come to the table with some ideas that they feel empowered. So once they feel empowered to do certain things, they're going to you're going to have additional buy in with internally within your team to do great things. Right. Uh, and then you start focusing on processes. Um Processes is, is is the core to everything, right? Uh, if you have bad processes, technology is not going to work and, and, and it becomes shelfware. So uh, the processes are, and those things are easy to fix. Just come up with a good policy, SLA, a governance strategy, and, and, then, and then start wrapping up technology around those processes. But So that's how I started to, to build uh, my operating model out too. Uh, even in my current uh, 
my current employment here, my first 30 days, which what I did was, I don't even wanna look at my technology stack. I'm not looking at my processes. I'm just gonna do a people assessment. And I met with the entire team from top to bottom, asked them one-on-one, -on -one, what can I make, what can I do to make you stay, right? It was kind of more of like a stay interview, like why would you wanna leave? And that kind of then starts really connecting to the hard strings of what's working and what's not working for these individuals. And then 30 days from there is then that's when you when I took action of, all right, this is my team. Some people are, are moving around to uh, other organizations within IT, other teams within IT, or, you know, unfortunately, you do not fit with where we're headed, and then uh, we're off to the races. So always pe focus, again, people, process, and then last thing, technology, because technology is the stuff that's expensive, and that's where you're going to start ruining your reputation too, right, is if you you roll out a half-ass product, you know, user adoption is low, the trust is broken with the, the business, and it's, it's over, right? So sometimes it is really good that some of these things take some time to deploy, right? It may take six, 10 months, but you do it once and you do it right. No one's going to remember, hey, that you roll out a product 30 days after your go live date or 60 days after your go live. No one's going to remember that, right? People are going to remember, hey, this was a crappy rollout and now I don't want to use it. So again, do not rush through this stuff. Take your time and make sure everything's squared away. Yeah, our esteemed CEO is famous for his quote of uh, trust is earned in drops and lost in buckets. And that that couldn't be more true. That That's right. exactly right. I, I, yeah, I love that. Hey, Martin. Yes. We got, we got about a third, a third, a third with the question that you asked earlier about who's part of their digital transformation. So a third said yes. Yeah. A third said sort of. <laughs> and then a third said no, not yet. So that's about where we are. And then, uh, and then I'm not sure how to interpret Mitch as we think we are. <laughs> actually that, that that actually resonates with me just coming from because oftentimes you're sitting there and, and there's that disconnect um I'll, I'll tell a quick story here just to, to sidebar um I, I was traditionally oil and gas I did a little bit of healthcare, but I did oil and gas when I first took a, a role um at a second customer I went and I met with all the business heads and um, I remember meeting with an infrastructure director there was super excited. We're moving a cloud. We're doing all this great stuff, innovation, moving the business forward. And I said, well, what are we doing? Hyperconverge, cloud, compute, it's going to be fast, going to be cheaper. I said, well, how is that providing us, you know, to, to, to do better in the, in the business? Where's the value we're getting from the business? And it couldn't get off of just how, ex you know, how great this IT stuff. And I was like, well, unless we're a data center company, I thought our goal was to get oil out of the ground and put it on the market, right? So we think in IT, we're aligned doing all this awesome stuff when the business is looking at us like, you're just a back office cost center, right? So we want to elevate those, get us to a level where we're really aligned to the capabilities of the business and using technology as a critical enabler to, to do that. So yeah, that, that actually does resonate with me, Mitch. <laughs> all right. Um, so now from like ServiceNow capabilities, you know, we see all ServiceNow has got a breadth of, of technical things that it can do um, and only growing for those that were at Knowledge or part of the Knowledge community last week. You saw just new innovation all the time coming onto platform. Uh, Riz, how, how is the capabilities of the platform, how did that help you at HJF um, improve your operations and, and your processes? 100% it provided a uh visibility right we were fully transparent from an it operations perspective and we're not working in a black box so think of it as an amazon experience right when you order a package you know where it is when it's being delivered they take a picture send it to you and full and you have a full visibility into uh you know from the beginning to end and it's the same thing that that ServiceNow platform provided us was, which was from a customer perspective is they know where things are, who's working on it and when it's going to be completed and also wrapped around SLAs and, and discipline internally within the IT team as well. Right. Because now guess what you, you need, it, it's, a, it's about efficiency and meeting customer expectations and their demands. And if you're not meeting those, guess what? We're going to see it and the customer is going to see it. And then we have, transactional surveys you're going to be dinged on that and we and what we did was we mapped this back to 
our performance goals internally as well, right? Because we're a metrics driven organization. Uh, it was not about, hey, what's, I'll, I'll get to it when I get to it. But, but with that too, the, the full transparency, that's where the trust started because they're like, oh, wow. I mean, now I actually understand what IT is doing, what they're doing. We even rolled out a whole, uh, our PPM, which, which was uh, tracking all our business projects as well, not just tickets, but the business stakeholders knew uh, where some of these projects were. And, and that allowed us to then carve out product owners as well. Like, hey, business, uh, finance, here's your product owner. We have our internal business systems team that's going to be partnered with you from an IT perspective as a product owner. So now we're actually becoming partners and we both have a say into what we're doing with a certain project. So uh, I think that the full, full transparency of what, how we were doing things uh, was a huge win that then baked in some of our processes too. I mean, ServiceNow, you're going to customize uh, things to your business requirements, right? Not everything's out, out of the box, but some of the stuff that was out of the box was a quick win for us as far as, you know, building out some good internal processes. Yeah, so the the the, the strategic portfolio management side, right, the project portfolio, I, I love that you, you incorporated that because that starts to change the conversation. Right. Oftentimes when I'm talking to customers, I'll go to a CIO and he's like, Martin, this is just expensive ticketing. You guys are super expensive. It's so expensive. Help me. So I'll go, I'll take a peek. We'll, you know, do some assessments. I'm like, yeah, you're right. We're expensive ticketing. It's because you're using us for ticketing, <laughs> you know, but we have all these other capabilities. Let's start looking at other initiatives that you're going in the organization and demand and project management is a great way to start. I'm not talking about service now, man. I'm talking about let's start with IT, but eventually get to enterprise, right? We, we have all these efforts that are happening. How are we making those trade-off decisions? How are we focusing where we're going to invest, where we're going to spend time, money, and resources? Because those are the, the, those are scarce, right? So I, I, that starts to change the conversation. I'm glad that you brought that up as um, part of your journey. Um, so you, you touched on this a little bit, but I'd like for you to elaborate a little bit um, just on how ServiceNow has enabled you to better engage with customers, with partners, with employees. And if there's any specific use cases that come to mind where other organizations may have learned from your efforts. Yeah, I mean, uh, to your earlier point, right, Martin, when we rolled out our project management uh, module, we also then started to look externally too from the procurement perspective. We're looking at our suppliers. We 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 built out a whole supplier portal where our uh, vendors were coming in uh, from filling out their assessments, contractual language to even a customer portal. And all of these portals that we started to, to, to build out, customer portal, vendor portal, CRM, uh, you know, you name it, even our finance workflow, HR uh, service delivery, we package all that stuff up. And we were probably one of the first um, to pioneer this is we built out our whole intranet platform. We, had, we were sitting on an old legacy, crappy intranet. And that was a cherry on top to bring everything that we worked on to, together, right? From ITSM to everything I just mentioned, on one single platform, people could go, you see where their tickets are, they could request things, uh, they could see what their customers are doing. And that intranet, that impact was just huge for us. And th this is what makes me smile a lot was Disney caught on. Uh, Disney heard about what we did. And this is the you know, 500, yeah, <laughs> 500 million, they're not in the news much these days. Uh, but $500 million, like a mid-sized organization, right? And Disney catches wind of what we're doing. And they they took our use case and they built out the entire internet uh, platform for Disney on the ServiceNow platform. So that was huge for us. We, uh, we, we were brought in to talk to them as well um, and it had a good like requirements gathering session and, and they took it and, and they ran with it, which was a phenomenal phenomenal win uh just because now you know that you're you're doing the things that are right the big boys that are out out there you know they're actually looking at us uh as, as some trailblazers to do uh, some things that are um you know best for their business as well so impact right it's, it's all about sharing in, in this community it's about helping one another and um that that was just 
I, I can't say enough. And, and then uh, ServiceNow, you guys, I think whip, whip that uh, a whole use case and so story around that. So I think that's even sitting on your internal intranet as well. Yeah, that, that that's excellent. So I want to stay here for just one second because you mentioned how you centralize the experience, which is huge because that's really where rubber hits the road. But that, that that's hard because organizations are built in silos, right? So talk a little bit about what the reaction was between, you know, your HR, your customer, all these different department heads and how they had to agree. Because, I mean, it, like agreement is, is probably the hardest part of, of, of any type of effort like that. Uh, it's a good question. What, what what we did too is what's what's the root cause of every organization, right? It's it's poor data. That that's it, right? People don't know where their data is. No data standardization. So, and that was uh, the same thing that we were struggling with at HAF. So that's what triggered everyone to come together. I started a whole data data integration project which was, hey, we're going to meet with each business stakeholder and just give me two or three core data fields that you want standardized, right? And, and we kept it simple, which was first name, last name, business unit, right? And, then, and, that, and that brought everyone to the table because we had people spelling names wrong, last name wrong, maybe first name, and it was just not... It was not standardized, right? So that, that might sound trivial, but I bet every person <laughs> on this call understands that pain, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So we we start with our finance, right, procurement and HR, and that and that and then that's where like, hey, our data stinks, right? Because at the end of the day, it's not IT's data; it's the business data. So do you business? Do you want your data to be efficient? Do you are you able to pull some good BI reports? Your workflows are they good or not, right? So we started there, and that's when everyone started coming to the table. And once we got those data sets formalized and fixed, this is where then we started to build out. Those silos started to break down because we're like, hey, HR, you know, you want these workflows. We could leverage HR service delivery, but you're pulling some of the financial data in, but you got to, you know, standardize that data set. And that's how everything started to come together. And everyone started coming to the table pretty rapidly. And, and it was, again, a monster win for us, but it was a culture shift. And, and that stuff takes time. That honestly, this is, did not happen overnight. This took about a year and a half of just trying to build relationships, build that trust so people could start working together. Because as everyone knows, like you could have a great strategy. I could have a great operational plan that's mapped to the strategy. But the culture will eat that strategy for lunch, right? And, and that's a hard nut to crack. So like my recommendation is even if you friggin' hate your CFO, right? Or CIO or, or, or your Chiro, whoever it may be, get that stuff out of your head. You guys have enough friends and families. You don't have to be friends with them, but you got to start winning those hearts and minds and, and go out to lunch for an hour, have just a conversation about anything, Right. And, and then that's where change starts to happen is, you know, you build these relationships and it's it's and it's going to make your life a lot easier from an IT perspective, to, to be honest. That's excellent. I love that quote. The culture eats it for lunch. That, that's awesome. You know, everybody wants change. Everyone wants everybody wants innovation, but nobody wants to change. Right. That, that's the hardest part here. Yeah. Okay, so um, give us some good and bad. What you learn from um, your from HJF? that you're going to carry on to CNA because you did some good work, but there's got to be some ugliness. There's got to be some badness. So talk a little bit about what you're going to uh, leverage in your experience now that you're uh, leading the efforts for CNA. I'll start with the bad, which was, um, you know, being a, a new CIO at the previous organization is I did have that. Ten I talked about business requirements and why that was important and all that. But when I started rolling, when I initially rolled out service now, I, we rolled it out at ITSM, but even that was a clunky rollout because I'm like, all right, this is just IT centric, right? We're just going to roll it out. But it wasn't because then we, we took it out of the box. That was my mistake. And then, the, you, you, you know, the messaging that's going out to our users, it had crazy like IT centric language. It was not very externally business focused. It had multiple links and people started to get really, really confused. And, and, and the other catastrophic mistake that I made was I did not have a good training program and communication plan in place to generate excitement, 
to train individuals and I was just trying to make my quick win and a quick impact. So when that thing came out, guess what? I had to dial that thing back in, bring it back in and then deploy it, redeploy it uh, about two months later. And, and that deployment went well, but that was one of my lessons learned is it's just make sure it's not out of the box, get your requirements together, get your training and communication plan. I mean, the good thing, right? I was there for what, six years. I was a, we were able to do, change the entire from top to bottom, how the organization works, right? We, when COVID hit, we had COVID self-assessment and testing um, workflows built in for HR, you know? So we were able to do a lot. Even then we started doing the facilities uh, workflows and, and um, it, it basically, the tentacles for service now in every single piece of organization at HGF, I mean, they were using it and the user adoption was high. We had a partner up with a third third party as well to get some service now delivery uh service now developers to to assist us because the demand was so high right we couldn't even keep up but that was that was a huge win and then what i carried over here with me is exactly i took what my bad experience was right so i built out a service now team here and uh, we did not have service now uh, my first four or five months, but I had a service now team. And I, and I told them, your, your only job for the next five months is you're going to meet every single business stakeholder and you're going to start building out a whole requirements library. We may not get to it a year or two from now, but you have it, throw it in the library. We just threw it on. The, and we built out a massive re repository for our, our requirements and um we're about to roll out ITSM here in the July timeframe. Right after that, I, I need to go for, for the external focus business impact. So we're pivoting fast to SPM, right? We're going to build that out for our projects, uh, for, for the business projects, you know, all of that. So they, they have some sort of appetite suppressant, but they can also see, all right, IT is finally delivering on something. So we were prepared and then, other than that was where we baked in our training program and we partner out with our communications team because I'm like, listen, IT people, we don't know how to write. We don't know how to communicate. So I need this, uh, our communication campaign to be in English where people can understand it. So they took our technical jargon, start uh, putting that into business speak. And, um, and we've been slowly like saying, hey, 30 days out, 60 days out, right? Like that, that type of communication plan just to generate excitement. So it's been it's been a good lesson for me from that bad experience. No, it's excellent. I, I want to reiterate one thing you called out. You said we couldn't keep up. We had to rely on a partner. So for any of our partners that are on the call, like having a solid partner is critical to any good operating model, right? It, it's your organization and your resources. It's service now what we can bring to the table and a solid partner is going to help you be su successful. So good shout out to uh, all the good work that our partner ecosystem does. All right, so let's talk about, um, and again, just coming fresh off of knowledge, I think I might know where this is going, but where do you see the platform evolving, right? We, we talk about all the power of what ServiceNow can do, uh, and then you can talk about what some of those evolving or emergent uh, capabilities um, would help you in, in, in CNA's digital transformation effort. AI, right? I mean, that's where it's at. Uh, LLM, ChatGPT, you name it. It's it's that's where uh, technology is going. That's where ServiceNow is evolving to. And and then you know, I had my meeting with my CEO about two days ago, and I'm already planning for FY26. And full disclosure, I told her like we may not have a service desk tier one team at that point, right? We we may just have AI running and addressing some of these questions that's pulling from the knowledge base articles that we have, some common themes that we've been seeing in the last couple of years. So we're already trying to start to plan for that. I already rolled out um, my LLM uh, governance strategy and policy about two weeks ago. Uh, so that's, that's been tremendous, but we're preparing for that. So, but that, that's where, that's where all of this stuff is headed and, uh, we're going to need, uh, unfortunately, probably in some cases, right. Less people, but this also opens the opportunity for additional people on the other side of the house, as far as, you know, maintaining and managing the AIs that are in the ecosystems. 
crypto, it opens up doors, right? And technology is changing every six months, something new is coming out. So it's, it's a good, uh, it's, it's, this is never ending. We're always learning in this space, right? So th I think that's a, that's a good positive to have that you're never going to get bored. Yeah. And we at ServiceNow are not unlike any other tech company where we're all trying to put strategies around how we're going to encompass Gen AI. And if you weren't there at Knowledge last week, go look at CJ's keynote. It's incredible what we're doing, even with stuff like Now Assist, which is now available on the store, you know, um, natural language, Gen AI, mod you know, creating forms, creating workflow. Um, so, yeah, that, that that's a, my shameless plug to the ServiceNow store to go download that app. <laughs> um, Okay, now we've talked a lot about ServiceNow, but ServiceNow, we, we tout ourselves as platform of platforms, breaking down silos, connecting systems, connecting data, as you mentioned earlier. So um, how has the Now platform helped you realize value and investments in other strategic platforms and technologies? I was able to decommission probably about four other technologies uh, because of, of the single platform, right? Uh, so, I mean... With, with the HR service delivery, we were able to minimize our HRS uh, system. We, re, we reworked that licensing. We were able to limit our footprint uh, from a financial perspective too, because we built out a lot of financial workflows and, and then also baked in some of the RPA stuff with, with some of those financial workflows. So that's been tremendous. So I was, uh, at least at HGF, I was able to, to save about $700,000 just to to rework some of the licensing and 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 some, some in certain cases decommission some legacy technology because again what I said er, earlier was one technology try to limit your technology stack right uh, and and save money on some of that stuff and be more efficient I mean even here uh, again we're early in our service now journey but I'm already about close creeping up close to a million dollars already that the technology that I'm going to decommission once service now goes live because we're going to hit the ground running here right after uh, ITSM drops. So uh, it, it, it tremendously helps. And so to your other CIOs, right? Yeah. Service now is it expensive? Yeah. But it's, it's one platform that could do many. So start looking at the other platforms that you could decommission that, our legacy or you no longer need, or this is your time to make the big impact to redefine some of the way that the business works, right? So again, we are innovators at heart and uh, we do honestly drive the business and, and, and the culture that starts changing, that starts with IT. It's not going to start with the business, right? It's we're we're a lot like business stakeholders where we're we're trying to change the hearts and minds of people of to work differently, right? And and start thinking outside the box. But that's how we were able to start, you know, start uh, saving a lot of money, which was look at what other things we could kill that we no longer need. That's great. Yeah. Anytime I go into work with an organization, the first question I ask is who owns a digital experience, right? And if it's not the CIO, then why is it not? because that's the person that's actually delivering the, the capabilities um, that, that are going to be uh, built as part of that experience. Right. Okay. So again, I, I got introduced to ServiceNow in 2010. To be honest, it was not something I was really interested in. I was literally Googling what is ServiceNow when my boss was like, here's this thing. Because you don't really know where to put it. Is it help desk? Is it corporate app? Is it APAS? Is it, you know, all these things. Um, but looking back, it's been one of the best things professionally, but also personally that's happened to me. So I'd love to understand how ServiceNow has actually helped you personally. It, this may sound corny. I mean, it is honestly, from a professional perspective, it, it, it just changed my life, right? I, I, I was just a, a CISO twiddling my thumbs, just me uh, in, in, in 2016 sitting there and I was able to build that, that whole department and and then when I was elevated to CIO, again, what I said was I was interim. So I made my big impact by bringing in service now to start building that trust. And that's essentially just changed me professionally. That interim title fell off. Uh, people are asking me, like you and John asked me for these speaking engagements. I've done several speaking engagements for service now. now and uh, when and then other organizations and other vendors in the space like you, 
you name it, uh, Z scale or Veronis's, they, they caught wind uh, of what I was doing for, for you guys. And they started asking me to do a lot of speaking engagements for them as well. So it kind of gave me some street cred. And the funny thing was that um, when I came here in August of, of last year, me and the CFO were new. I started one month before her. And you know how we all are. We'll start doing reconning before we jump into another organization and see what uh, what helps. I mean, what makes these people tick. And Christina, our CFO, I, I had walked in uh, and she was here a month later and she's standing in her door. She's like, hey, you must be Riz. I'm like, I, I am. Nice to meet you, Christine. She's like, she's like, I love service now. I Googled you and here's my list. And, and this is my first time in my life. I'm like, holy shit. I, I don't even have to sway or have these long conversations with the CFO to like open up your purse strings. And, and she said to me, she's like, when are, when are we getting it? I'm like, are you going to give me money? She's like, whatever you need to do, Riz, just get it done. And this was day one. So she's Googling me and looking this stuff up. And it, that kind of gave me chills. I'm like, wow, this is, this is friggin' incredible. Like that, like, like there's like no resistance, like people just, just, just falling over and, and, and I took her list and that became our part of it was our uh, service now roadmap of what we're going to do for finance. And it, and that's what it's done for me personally. And, and I'll take it another step further too. It's like, it's built out really good friendships. These are not just like business partners. Like Martin, when I'm looking at you, like we met what about, a month to two months ago, two months yep. ago. Right. And I feel like I've known you for the last 10 years. So like the, the relationships, meeting good people, you know, just shooting the shit and, and having a good time, but also working hard, strategizing and, and really stimulating thought uh, and, and just start thinking differently. It's made me better and it's made me grounded. And, and this is, I'm talking about a piece of technology and, and what is done for me. Right. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. And, and it's, it's been a, it's a been an awesome, awesome ride, but I can't say enough about the relationships. I mean, it, they matter, right. I really get turned off. And uh, when I was at, at, uh, the CISO that I was working for at the time, he, he had said to me, he's like, Riz, we're, we're going out to RSA. There's gonna be a bunch of vendors out there. Just, just use them and abuse them and, and get what you need to get and then come back home. And, and I, and I, kind of was like whoa like you're really treating people like commodities here and you really don't give a crap but he was a brilliant c so I, I, and I, I told myself hey i'm gonna do the do things differently like they're people just like us i don't want to be treated like crap like i will never ever treat you know quote unquote vendors or business partners like crap like at the end of the day, guess who's going to be saving your ass when you're in a pickle, right? It's it's going to be our vendors and partners that are going to be in there, or they're going to be in there talking to the CEO to try to help sway the conversation in your direction. So, uh, I, the last thing I want to do is, hey, if I'm if I'm if I'm if I'm in a jam, I'm calling Martin. I've treated him like crap, and Martin looks at my phone. He's like, hey, you know what? I'm fishing. I ain't picking this up, and puts it down. And two two three days go by, and Martin's like, hey, sorry, I was with a bunch of other customers. I'm getting to you now. Now, where the relationships matter is like he may be on his fishing. Oh, it's Riz. Hey, what's up, man? Like, uh, how can I help? What's going on? So that's that's what I've taken uh, from uh, my journey and, and the relationships and what ServiceNow has done for me is is it's given me a, a lot of new and good friends and we're just killing it together and it's it's been fun. That's awesome. I love hearing that. I do appreciate the partnership and the friendship there is. You're, you're exactly right. Okay. Uh, I think we've got two more questions and we're going to open this up to the group. But um, how have you been able to measure the impact of service now to the organization? You know, we always hear, you know, well, how do we determine the value we're getting from the platform? We do pulse surveys a lot, not just transactional surveys, but we'll send out, um, not here, but we, we're not there yet here, but my previous organization, we, we sent out, Whole surveys every three months. And also we sent out surveys 30 days after deployment of, of new modules that we were rolling out just to see, hey, what's working, what's not working. We generally focused on, on the bad stuff uh, of what was not working, just you know, lessons learned and what we where we could get better. 
And then second, then we pivot to the good stuff. All right, this is what's working. We continue to do this. But uh, I think surveys matter. I mean, they're huge. Generally, I, I get it with surveys too, right? I mean, if, if it's really, really good experience, no one's going to fill it out. If it's crappy, generally people will fill it out, right? But that's the stuff that we want to see, we want to hear. Um, and also, I, I, I made my rounds personally as well and said, you know, look, please be honest, tell me what's not working and, and we'll get it right. So and have that personal touch. But uh, that's how we kind of measured our overall performance. But with that said, too, I, I also looked at how did it make our CEO's strategic plan successful and better from the stuff that we were doing at ServiceNow. So did I meet his or her deliverables right and then you start peeling that onion back and a few layers down so yep service now did this but it you know it, it kind of impacted the strategic plan up there so it was it was a, a two-pronged approach that i took aligning what you're doing to organization goals and targets absolutely yeah yes. that's the best way to measure i agree okay last question then we're gonna open this up to everyone but you have a bunch of leaders bunch of people driving digital transformation in their own organization what advice are you giving to others that are either just taking this on or looking at expanding and maturing uh, within their own business? Take your time. Uh, be patient, I think. And I've, I've just harped on this enough. So I'm just going to say this one more time, but build good relationships. That way it's going to make your life a lot easier, but uh, also to have a good clear strategy, right? Why are you rolling out service now and how is it mapped to your enterprise-wide strategic plan. And, and if it does, then you're going to have an easier time to build that stuff out and tell your story. But uh, again, like um, you're going to end up buying a lot, right? That's that's inevitable. It's going to happen. Like, yes, it's expensive. I don't want to do this. I don't want to buy that, but it's going to happen. And the business is going to push for it. But but think, but just to slow roll a little bit, Think logically, build out your requirements, and come up with a good sound strategy before you start doing things out of the box, right? And, and what did I say? It was like, avoid building things out of the box because that's where you're going to lose the business because you don't, you have not engaged them. You want a quick win and you, you don't even know how that business is working. So avoid the out of the box, build out the requirements and start customizing and catering to how you do business within uh, your service now uh, ecosystem. Excellent. Awesome. Well, thank you for taking the time. I'm going to open it up and get some questions from the group here. John, I might need your help. I saw that we had a few coming in. Yeah, um, I think, uh, yeah, I'll try to roll some of them together so we can get as much as we can uh, in okay. the last few minutes. Yeah. There, there was a lot around the, the CMDB, uh, your approach to integrating with ITSM, uh, anything with digital products, and then also anything around portfolio structuring, if you have any. So I don't know if you want to comment on one or all of those together, but it, a lot of it was around that data foundations piece. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it's, all, it's a domino effect. We started with ITSM, right? I times CMDB followed that, then PPM, which I, what I'm doing differently here is it's it's going to be ITSM, ITOM, and then we're going externally to do the PPM, and then we're going to go back in and do CMDB. It, it all depends on how you want to do it, right? But internally, from an IT perspective, I think that's the way to, to, to go, which is ITSM, ITOM, CMDB. Uh, and, and get your data fixed internally within IT. That way, you know where your assets are. You know what applications you're you're managing. You got your asset management, your inventory there. You got some good orchestration and automation built in as well, right? And that'll alleviate some of uh, your IT's uh, time internally to to do this, where they're toggling back and forth through multiple systems. So, uh, I mean, that's how we did it. Again, I apologize because I'm not the technical guy here either, right? I'm just the CIO that's driving strategy, but that's that that was our game plan from here and my previous organization of how we started to roll this stuff out. One of the big things a lot of people are talking about today are like a shift from digital, from project management to product management. Yeah. Are you guys embracing any of that strategy and does that affect service now? Or? Yes. So that, that was my, that's my big push. And then some people are like, hey, we don't roll out products. No, you do, right? You're, yeah. you're, you're, you're rolling out products. And so I, 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 this is how I, I say it. It's like, 
you're going to build trust. So I want a product owner on the business side and I want a product owner on the IT side, right? So if we're doing a CRM, we're going to have an IT product owner on the CRM and then an IT, uh, I mean, a, a business development product owner, and they're going to partner and they're going to start talking about business requirements, how to build this stuff out. To, to gain even more momentum, what I, I've said to the team here is think of the product so, because I want to drive ownership and, and, and ownership is always hard, right? So I said, mm -hmm. think of this product that you're building. You're a CEO of a startup company. This is your product. Love this. So how are you going to market this? How are you going to have a good training plan, communication plan? And how are you going to make your customers want to use your product that you're rolling out? And that analogies change the minds because then it drives ownership. It, it also drives some pride too. Like, Hey, it, it, some competitive juices start flowing too. Like, yeah. look, look what I just did. My, my, my CRM is way better than your HR service delivery that you just did. Right. So <laughs> it, people get juiced up, but then also you start picking uh, some good ideas of what's working and what's not, but that, that, that's how I, I've been doing it. It's, it hey, we have projects, but within those projects, you do you you're working on a product and product owners are it's it's critical it's it's everything excellent and then the um other question i had come in was around um change happen oh the one i guess it's more of a comments around killing products so i know you know brad stone he he said the same thing as you like one of the things we always celebrate releasing new things but we need to celebrate getting rid of old things more so that was more of a comment. Um, and you said that a couple of times. So I thought that was really enlightening to hear that people, you know, need to make room for the new, right? Um, 100%. Um, so, I mean, I just, I said $900,000 right earlier. This is by, we're on the government fiscal year. I should be able in the next two months, I mean, we'll be at 1.2 million uh, killing legacy products already. Wow. That, that they're just not working. You know, we were, our ITSM here was, is, I don't know, I never even heard of this. It was, it was service wise, right? It, it sounds like it's more like service unwise, but it was service <laughs> wise. And it's like, we're done, man. And, yeah. and, and these little rinky things like 30 grand, 40 grand here I and mean, stuff starts to add up pretty quickly. And that's yeah. where you start investing in the next gen technology. Yeah, a lot of times I think that's a big part of the problems. You don't see that old stuff going out the door like it should be doing. So yeah. Okay. And what about back to that? Because people forget really quickly, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what about um people on this group? We talked a lot about portfolios because we got a portfolio for portfolios for portfolios. So there's the project portfolio, the app portfolio, the service portfolio, the catalog in a sense of portfolio. From a CIO perspective, have you had any specific portfolio, like anything that you look at to give you kind of groupings of things? Yeah. So you mean internally from an IT perspective or groupings of things from external? I'm talking like digital portfolios. How do you look at things? Do you look at them like in, in groups, in bunches of work, or do you have these product portfolios or is it individual products? Um, no, I, I look at it as, as product portfolios. That's how I, I'm looking at it. So I have my roadmap and, and it's there. It's like, all right, here's my products. This is the person associated with it. And that it, here's the health of it. Are we good? Are we not good? So I, I've been doing it from a product perspective. And that also, uh, I, I then take those metrics too. And then I do deliver the, that stuff to our CEO. And then uh, the board in some cases as well is, is because they're all worried about our our technical debt, right? So I could I could then showcase here are my products. These are things are in green, these are in red. Here's why it kind of tells you tells them a story, right? So it's more of a at a, a business perspective versus I'm not looking at did we breach any SLAs or you know dwell time on some 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 of these tickets or anything like that. I'm just looking at business products and 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 how we're uh, managing that. Do you have any costing at those at that level too, at the business product levels, or do we? We do. The okay. costing is it, it's it's going to be it's associated with that, and that was at HF. That's what we did. We're doing that here, but before I was able to do that, John, we're in the midst of also re talk about data, right? Our data here stinks as well, so we're re-implementing our financial management system. So that's gonna we're we should be done here in the next four months, and that's then we're gonna 
pivot, right? To start pulling in that financial data. So we have that associated with each product, but I couldn't do that initially, right? Cause our data was bad. So I didn't want any like phony baloney numbers that are associated with some of those products. Yeah. Okay. And then um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, this is a hard one, but it's like team. Um, some people are saying they have really small teams that how do you, I don't know if you have any words of wisdom around building a team and sizing a team. Some people say like, well, we've got stuck with three people and then all this stuff gets dropped on them or. Well, I think this is a, a good point, Riz. This might be a little uh, mic drop for you. How big is your team? My service now team is two people. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's it. And uh, even my, my previous organization, my service now team was two and a half people. We had a consultant uh, that was working um, half time. So it's just two people. And, and what I did was uh, I actually took this person from my previous organization. She came with me. So uh, I think that's why they're pretty much upset with me too. Uh, you know, you, talent follows, right? So, yeah. uh, but what I did with this individual is uh, she was working on some legacy, again, legacy technology. And I'm like, hey, we're going to bring in service now. And I, I worry about career development. I never want people to leave, but I will be the first one high-fiving them out the door because one day I may be working for them and it's all about paying it forward. So I, I told her, I was like, don't you want like a service now on your resume? She's like, hell yeah. It's like, you could get plucked in in two seconds. I'll invest in you. I'll train you. I'll do everything that you want me to do. And she was all in. And she's the one who's really interfacing with my, my, the business folks and building out those requirements. And then what I did was I took her and then uh, what Martin had alluded to earlier is uh, these are where your partners come in and mm -hmm. I, I could use some of their bench strength from, uh, you know, leveraging some of their developers and, and we could rapidly develop. Right. So uh, at HJF, I had about four developers on the bench with one of our partners and we, this is where we started to really generate and spit out a mass amount of products, workflows, you know, notifications, emails, all that stuff was just coming out really rapidly because she was like the, the connective tissue in between, you know, getting the business requirements, throwing it off the developers, they develop, she take it and then send it back. Uh, but she understands how service now works inside and out. Right. So what the developers were building out was was meeting the requirement needs of, of the business. Cool. So you don't need a lot of people. You, you at least internally, you 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 don't. Yeah, it sounds like you're doing. Um, I, I just read an article on the digital factory from McKinsey, and it sounds a lot like that. You're spinning up these kind of um, squads of people uh, focused on products, and then you can move partners in and out of the products as you need to. Yeah. And uh, so you're just basically redefining a structure that works for HR service delivery and then ITOM and you're moving them around. Absolutely. Okay. 100%. Yep. That's awesome. That's awesome. So there's your service now team is really big, but it's just spread out across the responsibilities are spread out. I think. Right. It's not just two people do everything, right? That's it's, a couple of yeah, people absolutely. are commenting. How would they do that with two people? But it's. Right. It's, right. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, John, it was like, uh, I think the four people cost me about a hundred grand a year without fringe, right? So that becomes part of your staff. That's that's a huge win, right? To to start generating things, and then I could tell the business and, and the CEO and the executive staff, hey, I didn't hire anybody. That's I got four people for a price of one, not even the price of one because you're not including fringe. So it, it's it's it was a, it was a big win. Yeah. So that's really integrating into the business, and that's how you accumulate the the help with it. Awesome. I think that takes us right up to the end. I'm, I'm happy to skip my section reviewing our next meetings because this was uh, this is incredible. We like to hear this. This is uh, taking everything from the top level. We've been a lot on the nuts and bolts in the CMDB. So I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. No, thanks yeah, for having me, John. And thanks, Martin. You bet. Bye, everyone. Yeah. All right, guys. Bye, everybody.